Look, I did the thwip thing for the thumbnail. I'm not gonna do it in the intro. Spider-Man Homecoming, Spider-Man of the MCU, finally gets his first film. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna do what I tend to do when I get a reviews out close to when the film actually premieres, which is I'm gonna talk as spoiler-free as I feel I can get away with for the first chunk, and I will tell you when I'm gonna start to get into spoilers. So, starting out with just the broad overview. It's good. It's very good. I, it's funny, watching it, it it's not particularly showy. So watching it, I was there were not a ton of moments that were like, oh my god, moments like I mean, for just for comparison, like the um, the airport fight in Civil War uh, is a good point of comparison, or the whole uh, time rewind battle at the end of Doctor Strange. There, there is nothing like that. And while watching it, there was a part of me that. I don't want to say it was unengaged, but it was kind of like, okay, this seems a little lower key. But honestly, that's right. That's correct. And coming out of the film, because I, I, I walked home, and so they gave me all the time to think about it because I wasn't having to focus on driving or anything. And I, the more I think about this movie, the more I like it. I think pretty much everything about this approach is right and is correct. Not just for the character, but for the character in the entertainment world we now live in. Because to, to put it the, another way, we got our super comic accurate version of Spider-Man back when Sam Raimi did it with his first two movies. I mean, there were little changes, but that, you know, in terms of who the characters were, how they interacted with each other, the, the bones of how every character was, it was really comic accurate. So we've got that version already. This one, is a lot freer to take things in a new direction. And none of the changes that they make feel superfluous. It never feels, to me at least, that they did it just because. Everything feels purposeful. So, and, and, and a lot of the changes, it really is about making Spider-Man for the current young generation because there was something oddly anachronistic about the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies because they were set in modern days, but they kept very much the feel of the 60s in terms of the character archetypes they were working with. And again, that came from the comic accuracy of it. Now, Amazing Spider-Man, they just they were just trying too hard. And even though I, I think Andrew Garfield was better in the role than a lot of people gave him credit for, the, the writing was very much, what do the kids think are cool today? Tom Holland is not trying to be cool. In fact, Tom Holland really is not cool. He's not supposed to be cool, but not in the over-the-top, let's make him the world's biggest dork way that um, Tobey Maguire's Sp Spider-Man could sometimes be. So it's a, it's a really good balance. It feels, the whole cast feels very real. Um, and, and I'm not going to go through everyone in the cast, but Tom Holland, we've already seen the part. He's good. He's great. Michael Keaton as the Vulture, is really good and, and he's a, he's an interesting villain and he's a perfect villain for Spider-Man in terms of what is motivating and the scale of things. I guess, like I said, the, the whole thing is much quieter. It's not big, it's not showy, but that really is right. Because this, this is the movie that we've really kind of never gotten because every other Spider-Man movie, he's always, you know, saving the city or, or something to that extent. This is us watching him be the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. He's just swinging around trying to help. And it the threat is suitably threatening, but it's on that scale. It makes sense that the Avengers aren't after the Vulture. Um, you know, because he's not, he's, they're above that pay grade to deal with somebody like the Vulture. But it's perfect for Spider-Man. And it, it really, everything just fits very, very well in that way. And so when I say this, you know, the scale is smaller, it just, it feels more intimate. It feels more grounded. And that and that is honestly this kind of a niche we're not getting from Marvel, or we haven't been getting from Marvel uh, up to this point. And actually, I would say that we haven't really been getting in superhero films in general. The closest might be the Marvel Netflix stuff. That's very ground level, but that's gritty ground level. This isn't gritty, but it is still the ground level. It's bringing it down to the hero who is down here in the trenches with us, the average people. And, you know, all the Avengers films, they're all, they, they, and all the, 
other ones that have fed into that, you know, whether it's Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, they're dealing with things much, much bigger. They're dealing with global, they're dealing with galactic size threats. Spider-Man's dealing with basically a, a, a super weaponized thief. And it just, it really works well. And Michael Keaton is very good in the part. I think he plays it really well. I think um, there's a lot of interesting layers in terms of how they built him that is still very true to the roots of the character, but is an interesting new take. I love the, the supporting cast at the school. I love his friend, Ned. I think he's terrific. Um, Liz was, was interesting as... Um, as a as a love interest, um, and there were some other characters who I Flash Thompson was interesting, and I think in a way I almost kind of want to highlight Flash Thompson and the changes made to him as to how they updated this for the current young generation, but still kept the characters serving their same functions. So Flash Thompson classically is just the stereotypical jock bully. He's a big guy. He's kind of dumb. He shoves Peter around. Um, here, Flash is still very much a bully but he's not that kind of bully because that kind of bully just I'm not gonna say doesn't exist in the real world anymore but feels dated and doesn't feel current anymore and if somebody was acting like that in real school you'd be like they still make you what so he is very much a bully but you know he's He's more about the so the social pressure, and he's not stupid. He's a smart guy, but he's he's about impressing people. He's about you know f making himself feel bigger by belittling Peter. But it's not the bullying bleh, kind of stuff that Flash is classically known for. So it's still a bully, but it feels like a true modern bully as opposed to this old archetype that's not only outdated but we've gotten already in the previous version of Spider Man. So we don't need that exactly again. As film went on, I actually think my favorite thing was just spotting the differences and seeing what was changed. And I had a lot of fun with that, especially because some characters don't get name dropped until like later in the film and after you've seen them a little bit. And then some names got dropped and I ended up going, oh, I know who that is. And that was really cool because things that they had done about the character made it not immediately obvious, like on site, who that person was. But once the name got dropped, and this happened with a couple different characters. So, but once the names got dropped, I was like, oh, that makes sense. It's different, but it makes sense. And I felt that a lot as the film went along. Um, but even if you're not deep into Spider-Man's comic book origins, you gotta catch all the Easter eggs because there are a ton of them. Um, but even if you're not like me or like the geekier folks like that, it's still just really fun. And um, oh, the other person, I wanna highlight uh, Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark because, and especially, he gets a scene where he gets to be serious, and I actually really love him there, where sort of the facade of cool, easygoing guy drops, and he gets really, really serious about what's going on. And moments like that are why I am glad we are retaining Robert Downey Jr. for as long as he's willing to keep doing this part, because everyone, you know, they think about, you know, the snarky, the quippy kind of thing, and he's very good at that. But it's the emotionally sincere moments that he really sells. And I mean, that was a big part of why uh, Civil War worked. And he's got a scene in this that is really does that very well. I think the one other thing I want to address before I get into outright spoilers is um, I, made the, I made a point, and I'd said this in some previous videos, of stopping looking at the marketing um, after seeing the first full trailer. Because I felt like that laid out the uh, more of the plot than I wanted to know. So I saw the teaser, I saw the first full trailer, then I was like, I'm done. I don't want to see anymore. So how much more got revealed after that, I don't know. But as far as that first teaser and that first trailer go, it did lay out a pretty good chunk of the plot in terms of the structure, but there are still a lot of surprises in terms of the nuts and bolts of how things get from point A to point B to point C, etc. that it didn't feel like it gave the entire movie away. It Because it did, it does take some tangents and it does go some interesting places and it does linger in some interesting things. But I do still think that Sony gave away too much in the marketing. Um, but overall, this is really good. As I said, the more I think about it, the more I like it. And I don't, I don't have any major complaints on this. I've got a couple nitpicky things and I'm not even sure I'll remember to bring them up as I get into spoilers. But yeah, 
This is really good. So getting into spoilers, a lot of this is just going to be me gushing about the Easter egg stuff and some of the name drops that we got. We got a uh, Mac uh, Gar Gardenen. God, I uh, forget the name now, but the Scorpion. The Scorpion gets name dropped um, and shows up in a post credit scene. And it's an actor I love. If you're into gaming at all, he played Vaz in Far Cry 3. Um, if you watch Orphan Black, he's on that and he's, and he's really good. So uh, the minute they dropped his name, I'm like, oh, Ooh, that's nice. Donald Glover uh, is is he's the Prowler. That that was awesome. And you, okay, Liz. I made the assumption, I think, as most long-term uh, Spider-Man fans did, that, you know, no, it's Liz, Liz. Oh, that must be Liz Allen, who is, in fact, his first girlfriend in the in the comics. You know, before Mary Jane, before Gwen Stacy, uh, before Betty Brant, before any of that, there was Liz Allen. And she's kind of been forgotten by time in a lot of ways. So we had assumed that. So when the door opened and there's Michael Keaton as the vulture, and you realize he's her dad, you're like, oh, crap. And so that was a great moment, well played. And the, and the reveal at the very end of this character, who I, Michelle, who I don't even remember her be, being called that throughout the movie, but her get, saying, no, my friends call me MJ. I had loved that character up to that point. I thought she was a lot of fun and I loved her dynamic towards Peter, towards Ned, and just this sort of slightly outcast but can't help but be kind of charismatic character. It's a weird balancing act. It's like, I, I can't even nail down exactly why she works so well but when she got dropped oh call me MJ I'm like oh yes give me more of her and I love that Liz whether she was Liz Allen in this case I guess Liz Toomes um is not going to be coming back and be the recurring love interest because she was good and she was fine and certainly as uh you know in terms of an evolution for tom holland as spider-man i think she was an important stepping stone in terms of him you know gaining some confidence trying to have a social life and all that but i like that she's not sticking around to actually be the love interest partly because um you know i i get annoyed with love interest driven stories and i think they had just the right dose of it here but also because I'm kind of sick of stories where it's like, oh, the first girlfriend you have in high school is the love of your life. Bull. You know how often that happens? Like, never. So I, I like the idea that he had a girl that he cared about and there was something there, but it's not going to work. And he's going to move on from that in, in the next film, presumably. So I, I liked all of that. Um, I was nice getting Jon Favreau back. Happy Hogan was featured way more than I would have thought. Oh, and... Gwyneth Paltrow back as Pepper Potts. That was a wonderful, sweet surprise. I I really thought we were never going to see her again. So for her to show, and she may never show up again, you know, if they never decide to make another actual Iron Man movie, if he's only just appearing in Avengers and stuff like this from now, there might never be a place for her again. And so that's fine, but I kind of like that. It's like, oh, no, 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 they're still good. They're, they, they reconciled, they're back together. I like that because it felt like, I think uh, them being split fit Civil War, um, but I kind of like the idea that he's gotten in a good enough place that they've reconciled. And again, I don't need to see more of them together, but that was just, that was just a sweet surprise. I really liked that. Um, and yeah, and, and the Vulture, I love the motivations and the backstory for the Vulture because they, they make him really relatable because he's a guy who's getting jerked around. He's a, guy, he's a guy who's getting screwed. And so you understand his motivation. And, you know, they also did sort of the classic, um, you know, gangster in a movie justifying, you know, I'm doing this for my family. And that's a little bit of a cliche, but I think that early scene, because um, I that where we see how badly he's getting screwed by the system and he's like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna find my own way to make this work, and I think that works really well. And I think Michael Keaton plays him very well. Um, I said that earlier, but he he does he he does a really good job of swapping back and forth between being menacing, being charming when he needs to be. Um, and I like I like that they didn't kill him. Not so much in a sense of he must be back for the sequel. I I mean he could still be in jail in the sequel. I wouldn't care so much. But it was important to me that Spider Man went and dragged him out of that fire because that is who Spider Man is. That's who this Spider Man is, especially. And actually, whew, this is a real low body count movie. 
I mean, there's one definite death because the vulture kills one of his henchmen. The, the first shocker, and then we get this other guy being the shocker, and I thought that was a fun flip around. Um, and, like, there's one guy on the ferry who gets knocked off the ferry with a car. I think he's probably dead. Um, but again, I think that happens, like, in the confusion with the vulture going on. So there's, like, there's a body count of two. That's really low for a superhero movie. And that's right for Spider-Man. That's correct for Spider-Man. Oh! The other thing that I, I really like, um, and I was surprised because when it first happened, it, Karen! The voice in the suit. When he first started talking to the suit, I'm like, that's weird. Why are they trying to make him like Iron Man and talk to the suit? Except his dynamic with Karen is completely different from the dynamic that Tony had with Jarvis or with Friday later on. So it doesn't feel like a retread in that. And more than that, it basically gave a justification. And I didn't realize this until I thought about it. It gave a justification for him to keep talking to himself when it's just him and the suit. It gives him someone to talk to, so he's not just talking to himself, but he says the kind of stuff that in the comics we always get thought balloons for, or he's always talking to himself. That's just something that doesn't necessarily work in film, um, because it seems weird. It's like, why is he talking to himself? In comics, you know, we get a thought balloon, we get an, a, you know, a caption box, whatever. So that was always one of the things about the Tobey Maguire, is that he seemed oddly quiet. Um, when he was in the suit. I mean, yeah, he banter a little bit, but, he, you know, we weren't getting that running, you know, inner thought process and monologue that's actually kind of really at the heart of Spider-Man's presentation. It's a superficial thing in the comics, I grant, but it really does feel kind of key to him in a lot of ways. So by allowing him to talk, by giving him this AI to talk to, kind of bringing that back, that was really nice. Plus, the, I mean, that relationship became oddly sweet. This is just a really smartly conceived movie. And like I said, all the changes I feel are made for smart reasons in terms of what's being altered to make him a kid of now as opposed to trying to make him reflect the, you know, a teenager in the 60s like he was originally written to me and like Sam Raimi kind of already gave us. I just really like this movie. And like I said, by the end, I was just really enjoying catching all the changes. So Spider-Man Homecoming. It's, I, I don't know where it would fall in terms of my rankings of Marvel overall. It's upper half easy. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to figure out exactly where it would go, but it's up there. And it is unquestionably the best Spider-Man movie since Spider-Man 2. So, yeah, go see it if you haven't already. God, if you haven't, why did you stick through the spoiler section? That's it. I'm going to wrap this up. So, uh, in any case, folks... Have you seen Spider-Man Home Company? Home Company? What? Homecoming! What did you think of it? Whatever you thought, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Don't forget to like, subscribe, check me out on Twitter at Council of Geeks. Give a listen to the Council of Geeks podcast available on iTunes and Stitcher. I am also one half of the Punch Like a Girl podcast, also available on iTunes and Stitcher. And until next time, this council is adjourned. <laughs>